Hello, hello, hello. It is me, it is me, your True Hill Phenom SP3. We are here for our year-end countdown for 2020. This time, we are doing the top 10 best major shows or pay-per-views of 2020. I am here with your roundtable rebel, uh, an expert when it comes to the major shows that went on this year. He is the three-time, three-time. Three time, three time, baby making champion. This is Ness. True Hills, what's the deal? Glad to be here. Recap of all the great major shows we've seen this year. And yes, I probably was on the round table reviewing them. So had lots of fun then and we're gonna have lots of fun doing this right here with the True Heel Phenom SP3. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me, sir. I thought you were like, the perfect person to be on this uh, roundtable with me. We had a whole bunch of major shows. True Hill Heat's YouTube channel, we introduced the pay-per-view roundtable this year. Our first one, I believe, was WWE Money in the Bank 2020. So quite an interesting one. I think that was the first of the uh, post-WrestleMania pandemic era for WWE. We've, we've reviewed all the pay-per-views pretty much since then and had a whole great time doing it but you've been the six man the round table rebel for a bunch of them so you have your experience on most of these some was before the pandemic some during the pandemic but it was quite the interesting year in 2020 in professional wrestling what's been your overall thoughts on 2020 as far as the uh pay-per-views go uh, uh i gotta give props to the you know these promotions man like 2020 has been a crazy year just for, you know, regular people in general, you know, people like you and me. So I know big companies like that thrive on us, you know, the fans, especially coming to their shows and giving them, you know, money. So these the promotions, they can keep going, you know, and, and give us the wrestling that we love. Um, it's definitely it was hard, but, you know, I got to give them props for, you know, especially during the pandemic, the post post pandemic everything going on like they've still continued to push through and um a lot of the shows that i i feel i feel as though that they were very good you know the the only thing that was missing you know the aspect of the crowd but you know at this point that's pretty much the new normal for for wrestling in general but um like i said i just gotta give them props for continuing to do it but in some of the shows you know even though the you know the crowd is missing but they they go out there and they put it on. I think I think some of the um, the performers might do better in this type of atmosphere because they don't have the live crowd there to like they can shake a little bit of the nerves, you know. So they're not going yeah. out there and worrying about oh I gotta mess up somebody's in the front row gonna heckle me and, and things of that nature. But yeah, man, I just, pr props to all the promotions that just, just trying to make it through. We're all we're literally all in this together. Absolutely. We have four different promotions that have made our top 10 list here of the best major shows of 2020. Um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention any like honorable mentions. I got to mention um, AEW All Out. Uh, that was probably the weakest of the AEW uh, pay-per-views this year, but it was definitely a show that had memorable moments such as MJF versus John Moxley. You had uh, the FTR defeating Hangman Page and Kenny Omega for the AEW World Tag Team Championships. Thunder Rosa defeating, uh, I mean, John Thunder Rosa versus Hikaru Shida for the AEW Women's World Championships. Speaking of Thunder Rosa, NWA Hard Times with uh, Thunder Rosa winning. Winning the eight the NWA Women's World Championship from Allison K. You had the television tournament won by Ricky Starks and a hell of a year for Ricky Starks starting off in NWA, winning the television championship and then moving over to AEW. But it all started at hard times for him. The interpromotional match between Flip Gordon of ROH and Nick Aldis of the NWA. So we we had a couple of uh, good ones. Any honorable mentions that you want to mention? I actually just want to piggyback off of yours, man. That was actually pretty good. Um, yeah, the only thing, only thing I got is just like the major, the ones that are actually going to make the list. <laughs> you know, I'm just focused on everything that's going to make the list. <laughs> yeah, that definitely got to, yo. Those, those are some great, some great honorable mentions. <laughs> 
A couple, couple more that just came to my mind. Uh, NXT TakeOver In Your House. I think the nostalgia factor in that makes that a very memorable show for the year. Uh, WWE had, a, I, I would say, one of their more consistent years when it comes to pay-per-views, whether that be Hell in a Cell with the great uh, three Hell in a Cell matches, Roman versus Jey Uso, Bailey versus Sasha, and uh, Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton. The first show they had in the Thunderdome uh, pay-per-view was was SummerSlam, which was a really good show with Drew versus Orton, Asuka versus Bailey. But that leads us into coming in at number 10. And before rewind, Chris edit this. <laughs> before we get into the top 10, give this video a thumbs up. Uh sh share it with all your wrestling fans and friends. Push the i card down at the bottom to subscribe and the bell below that to stay notified for all the great content right here on True Hill Heat. So coming off of SummerSlam, their first major uh, pay-per-view, two pay-per-views later is our number 10 choice right here, WWE Clash of Champions. This one was one that I think came out of nowhere to be one of the better shows of the year for the WWE in the main event. One of the best main events of the entire year for the promotion was Roman Reigns going one-on-one -on -one with Jey Uso. Jey Uso having... In my eyes, one of the breakout years of 2020, and what a hell of a performance that he had in this match. Great babyface effort. You had Roman as the tribal chief trying to get his cousin to acknowledge him, acknowledge him as the head of the table, acknowledge him as the tribal chief. And just this was some of the best storytelling that you saw in WWE all year as far as in a match. You also had the the very good, very fun ambulance match between Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton. And these two guys have one of the better feuds. Of the year as well and in my eyes the match and one of the matches of the night was the opener the ladder match with Sami Zayn versus Jeff Hardy versus AJ Styles Sami Zayn with a gr hell of a heel effort uh, ha using handcuffs to his advantage to get the win any thoughts on WWE Clash of Champions Ness yes and I was on a round table for this and I am completely marked out for that opening match Sami got what he deserved you know, he wasn't beaten for the Intercontinental Championship. Got to come back. So I don't know if it's, like, it's that meme where he got the two buttons. You don't know which one to press. Like, oh, he's either he never lost and got the championship back or he's a two-time champion. So I don't know which one to press. But, you know, that was definitely one of the most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, innovative ways to have someone win a match when he put the handcuff through uh, Jeff Hardy's ear. Uh, that, that was crazy. Uh, what else? Definitely the main event with Roman versus Jey Uso. Again, I was one of the ones that wasn't fully on the belief that it was a uh, Roman's heel turn. I just thought that his attitude was a little bit amped up from, you know, how it was before he, he you know, took time off with the pandemic and everything. But, man, him coming back full throttle and then just this whole storyline with him and Jey Uso was like, you know, I, I am the top guy, not only in the business, but in our family. And you're going to acknowledge that one way or another. And. You see where that's at now. Jay's acknowledging. Roman has to remind him uh, in more ways than one uh, a, a few times. But Jay knows who who who's running the face or who's the face to run in the place and running the family. So he's definitely falling in line. The yeah, Clash of Champions, I think, was a uh, uh, was a major step up from what was before that summer. Was it SummerSlam? I believe uh, they had the payback pay per view like payback, week uh, after after uh, SummerSlam. Yeah. Yeah. Classic, he's yeah. definitely a, a step up in the right direction. I think all, all the matches that night delivered, but those were just two of my favorites. Yeah, this this one this one was really held up by those uh, three major major matches there. We also saw the return of Sasha Banks on this night as uh, Bailey defending this SmackDown Women's title against Asuka. Pretty good matchup between Asuka and Selena Vega. This was, uh, ironically, Selena Vega's last pay-per-view appearance in the WWE. Uh, so, you know, shout out to her with all that controversy behind the scenes going on in WWE. But we have to move on to number 
nine. Coming in at number nine is AEW Double or Nothing 2020. This one was AEW's first pay-per-view after the whole global pandemic. And it will be remembered for the place that the first ever stadium stampede took place. In my eyes, mess, the cinematic match of the year. When it comes to everything you would want in a cinematic match, you want some comedy. You want good action. You want a you want a hell of a story, and you just want memorable moments. And this had a little bit of all of that. Hangman Page coming in on the horse, uh, a ring in the middle of a football field, and these guys running through spots in the ring. You had the Hangman Page and Jake Hager bar fight with Kenny Omega coming in for the save, and then them sharing a beer and a and a glass of milk. Uh, you had the Matt Jackson giving the Northern Light Soup has through. 100 yards on Sammy Guevara and of course you had Chris Jericho giving the Judas effect to the mascot and the final finale of them all with Kenny yeah. Omega giving the one wing angel to Sammy Guevara just a hell of a match this show also featured MJF versus Jungle Boy in a very underrated uh, bout very old school base John Moxley defending the AEW world title against Brody Lee and Brody Lee's first major like great match that he had post WWE. So, what's your thoughts on Double or Nothing? Ness? Yeah, the Stadium Stampede match, oh man, that definitely has to be, well, of course, it's amongst us, we're going to say that was definitely the best cinematic match of the year. Um, gotta, gotta, you got to mention the go kart. You know, Sammy, uh, Sammy Guevara getting mauled down by the go kart, <laughs> Kenny Omega and uh, Matt Hardy. But yeah, man, just AEW knows how to do it. They they definitely know how to go out there and deliver and and if there's a there's a time that they don't they reassess and they say hey we're gonna make sure we knock it out the park the next time so that was definitely one of the better pay per views in my in my opinion of this year um, definitely love to see I'm a big Brody Lee fan he just needed a spot to be, go out there and do what he can do and that's be a a, a great character and also uh, have put on a great match, great in ring uh, work, especially against you know probably one of the best, if not the best, wrestler of 2020 in John Moxley. So you know just got to give props to those guys and then just just let the whole card and the whole show just delivered. So definitely big ups and big props to AEW for a phenomenal show. Yes, this was a lot of memorable moments on this one. The casino uh, ladder match, which featured the debut of Brian Cage, where he won the number one contendership for the AEW world title. You also had Hikaru Shida defeat Nyla Rhodes in a very, very good no disqualification match, which she won the AEW Women's World Championship. And you also had Cody Rhodes defeat... Uh, Lance Archer to become the first ever TNT champion. So this is really a show that AEW can definitely hang their hat on for 2020. Coming in at number eight is the first paper, the first uh, major show we will talk about that was pre-pandemic, and that was New Japan Pro Wrestling New Beginning in Osaka. This one was main evented by Tensuya Naito defending the IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships against Kenta. This followed uh, Kenta ending uh, the uh, Wrestle Kingdom show by attacking uh, Tensuya Naito and trying to end trying to end his celebration prematurely so sad so sad i know i know i know this is bad for ness to relive but yes yeah. this happened um but this this show will be remembered mostly for two of the probably the best matches that people forget because 2020 has been a very 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 long year so you tend to forget the great matches that happened pre pandemic but there was some stellar ones and two of those would be Hiromu Takahashi versus Ryu Yi for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championships 
probably one of the most insane matches junior heavyweight matches that we saw all year these two are bitter rivals from mexico to the united states to japan and they just delivered a an all-time classic to really kick off hiromu's junior heavyweight title run that started at russell kingdom but you also had two of the the craziest dudes in professional wrestling go one-on-one -on -one for the iwgp united states championship as the aforementioned john moxley went one-on-one -on -one with minoru suzuki this was hard hitting to the core one of the 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 best brawls of 2020 these guys just went at it with forearms with headbutts with hard hitting action throughout and one, one you would think it's for the never open weight championship but no it was for the united states gold and these two had a memorable feud and it culminated here any thoughts on new beginning in osaka ness i'm just well to start as being a naito fan and the despicable, disgusting actions displayed by Kenta at the end of uh, Russell Kingdom. I'm just glad that Naito is able to show him that, you know, you don't disrespect champ. So that was definitely one of the moments at the top of my list. But, yeah, definitely Hiromu Takahashi versus uh, Ryu Lee. Man, these guys just, I've been following their, you know, their rivalry for the past couple years. And even, like, their weakest match matchups that they have are better than the best matches that i've seen some people have and that like that's crazy to me like it's, i can watch a, watch one of their matches and I'm like oh man it's not better than their last one but still say oh well, this is better than 90 percent of the other stuff that we see all over watching wrestling so that was definitely if not one of that's one of my favorite feuds just period wrestling all, all together um minoru suzuki and and john moxley definitely a brawl both are actually like great brawlers and that that's what their styles are based around. So having them two meet up and then just go at it, especially in, in a, a major pay-per-view setting, you know, it just made for a big fight feel. And that's exactly what we got out of the match. And, you know, kudos to John Moxley being able to so survive Minoru Suzuki because there's not a lot of people that can say that. And then, you know, are still here to live and, and, and tell about it. So, you know, props, props to him for that. <laughs> Absolutely. This show also had uh, Switchblade Jay White defeat Sonata in a one-on-one -on -one matchup. We also had Rapungi 3K defeat Suzuki Gun for the IWGP Junior Tag Team titles. Definitely a show worth going out of your way to rewatch because even someone like me, I had to rewatch this and get more familiar with this show before we did this countdown. And it was a hell of a show, but it was really highlighted by those top three matches that we talked about earlier. So coming in at number seven is Impact Wrestling Slam Aversary. This is the only show on our list here from Impact Wrestling, but a hell of a show to highlight. This was their first after the whole global pandemic, and they promised huge surprises throughout this pay-per-view. They were following the WWE controversial Black Wednesday, where they let go of 40% of their employees, including a whole bunch of wrestlers. We had the debut of Heath Slater, in Impact Wrestling. We had a vignette for Brian Myers. You also had the Good Brothers debuting uh, here on this show. Eric Young made his triumphant return to Impact Wrestling in the main event five way to determine the new Impact Wrestling world champion. This also followed Tessa Blanchard's controversial release from the promotion where she relinquished the title and five uh, competitors met in the main event. Eric Young was one of them. The returning Rich Swan from the injury. You also had Eddie Edwards, Ace Austin, and Trey Miguel of the Rascals. Hell of a matchup. All action. Uh, Eric Young was one of the first to be eliminated in this one, and he took out his frustration on Rich Swan, which really kick-started probably one of the better feuds of 2020 for Impact Wrestling. But in the end, it came down to Eddie Edwards and Ace Austin, and Eddie Edwards with the Boston Knee Party he became the two-time Impact Wrestling World Champion. You also had a hell of a bout, a barn burner between Jordan Grace and Diana Peraza, with Diana Peraza becoming the Impact Knockouts Champion for the first time. Anything that stood out to you from Slammiversary? Uh, so much going on on this show here. So, what was your thoughts, Ness? Yeah, a lot of the the 
uh, returns and debuts made sense. Um, the matches I definitely, I definitely wanted to uh, bring up Deanna Peraza versus Jordan Grace. That was an um, that was an amazing match. Kudos to both ladies on their performance. Um, Deanna Peraza, in my opinion, didn't we the wrestling that we get now from her and Impact. There we had no glimpses of that when she was in NXT or you know that short stint that she had on Raw. Like I'm so glad she took her talents to impact because now people can actually see her like she's a, a great technical wrestler and i don't want to say she's a great technical wrestler for a female you know i'm not sexist or anything like that but she does have great technical prowess and we were never able to see that so i'm it, it's definitely great that she's an impact now where they can focus and she's been just been running killing it in the um knockouts division so definitely props to her but also, I want to piggyback off of you know the five way for um, the for the, the uh, well I, was, I forgot what it was for but the impact um, title <laughs> Eric Young I just want to speak on Eric Young man his return that's where you know the world class maniac was born in that match you know him being one of the TNA legends returning now under impact him being taken out by the likes of Rich Swan you know nobody knew this is where this that feud was gonna go you know like that the subtlety that stopped that started there you know with him going crazy just snapping and then injuring rich's leg and then he just took off from there just started running through the whole roster now he has joe doring um also you know one of the guys that you hate but you might it might enjoy now cody diener is under his wing now like this is all started at Slammiversary, and this is pretty much one of the better, if not one of the best, storylines going on in Impact at the moment. So Slammiversary was definitely one of the better um, pay-per-views this year for uh, Impact Wrestling, and it definitely kick-started one of their pretty much probably the top heel in the promotion currently. So definitely props for them for that, and then running with the stories to keep this, uh, to keep everything going along as well. Yeah, besides, yeah, besides all the uh, guys returning from WWE, you also had the Motor City Machine Guns make a triumphant return to Impact Wrestling, defeating the Rascals in a, in a very fun opener. You had Kylie Ray win the gauntlet for the go to get a shot at the Impact Knockout Championship. You also had Chris Bay win the X Division Championship in this one. So a whole bunch of fun, great action throughout the night and definitely Impact Wrestling's best pay-per-view of 2020 coming in at number six we got nxt take over 31 usually when you do a top 10 major shows major pay-per-views of 20 of any year over the last like five years takeover is going to come up more than once but this was a very interesting uh year i think that one of our honorable mentions that we should mention is uh uh, take over Portland, which was fantastic. But I dis what well, we decided for this list to to highlight Takeover Thirty One because Takeover Portland is a great show, one of probably the best takeovers of all time. But Takeover Thirty One had more obstacles to overcome with the global pandemic. This was their first show in the Capitol Wrestling Center. And boy, oh boy, did they deliver uh, a takeover quality performance among all the the obstacles and challenges that they had. This show started off with Damian Priest defeating Johnny Gargano in a very hot opener that really kick-started the whole Capital Wrestling Center era for NXT. The main event is one of the best matches of the entire year from NXT and the WWE as a whole as Finn Balor defeated Kyle O'Reilly. This was hard hitting, technical base, and an absolute masterclass in professional wrestling. Two of the best performers in NXT history coming together to have a classic NXT championship matchup. But this also had Io Shirai defeating Candice LeRae in a very good uh, NXT Women's Championship match. You also had a very surprise performance, a breakout performance for both Santos Escobar and Isaiah Swerve Scott for the cruiserweight championship so so much to highlight from this show what was your thoughts on takeover 31 ness yeah definitely want to start with the main event um props to um, finn balor but 
everybody pretty much knows like about Finn. Not that they don't know about Kyle O'Reilly, but they don't know how good of a single star and a singles competitor Kyle O'Reilly can be. You know, everybody knows him as he's either tagging with Bobby Fish or, you know, um, Roger Strong and sometimes Adam Cole. But Kyle can definitely go out there and handle his own in singles matches. So I think that this was a showing for people to know that, like, maybe down the line, if, um, if they don't end up breaking up undisputed era because you know that's like a wwe thing to do um if if they let him if they still run you know they want to like move around the pieces and not have adam cole just be the figurehead at the moment they can definitely trust in kyle to you know reboot give it you know give it the the, the faction a, a fresh start if they ever wanted to put a singles title on him i would go you know i would go for the gold at the top but, you know, I would even take a North American title run at this point. Um, definitely want to talk about the uh, NXT Cruiserweight title match between Santos Escobar and Swerve Scott. I said it before, these guys have great chemistry coming from Lucha Underground, being kill shot, and, um, oh, man. King Quano. King Quano. Yeah, there we go. These guys definitely put on great matches there. So I, there was no doubt in my mind that they were going to, going to do the same in nxt and they definitely delivered that was one of my favorite matches of the night and um yeah just overall the show delivered from top to bottom you know if, if you're always looking for something in of a wwe under their brand to watch and you want to see something that goes out and it hits every nail on the head you definitely want to take over you want to take over shows like so go out of your way to see this if you haven't and if you have go out there just to relive it because it was such a great show to watch Absolutely. Couldn't say it better myself. Coming in, we are going into the top five and coming in at number five is New Japan Pro Wrestling G1 Climax 30 Day 13. Now the G1 Climax always gives us some of the best wrestling of the entire year. You have 20 of the best of New Japan Pro Wrestling coming together in an A block and a B block and delivering their best matches that they possibly can against some of the other best performers in all of professional wrestling. But G1 Climax Climax 30 day 13 is the highlight of this year's G1 because the A block was just so stacked, absolutely stacked. And this was the night that introduced so many of the greatest matches that probably of the entire 2020 in the entire industry of professional wrestling. You had Jeff Cobb in the, his career best matchup against Toma Ira Ishii and hard hitting brutal encounter that just has to be seen to believe Toma Ira Ishii is the most underrated professional wrestling in the business today and he lived up to his moniker here in delivering an all time classic but this one will be remembered for the two main event matches as it was Koto Obushi going one-on-one -on -one with Minoru Suzuki in the eyes of many this was voted on by the Wrestling Observer newsletter as the best match of the G1 Climax 30 Dave Meltzer himself called it the most realistic and greatest uh, fight scene in professional wrestling that it was basically a fight scene from any great karate film or action movie that you will ever see in a professional wrestling ring and you have to know that that is possible when you have two competitors such as Koto Obushi and Minoru Suzuki like we said before Minoru Suzuki one of the best brawlers in the game and Koto Obushi one of the very best professional wrestlers in the entire world and they uh, delivered an all time classic here that that was rated 5.25 stars from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. But another one that received the, the above 5 star moniker was in the main event. As a first time ever matchup between Shingo Takagi and K Kazuka Okada. Okada had what we call a minor year for Kazuka Okada. He's one of the all time greats. But it, this was not a year where he delivered the match of the year candidates on, on top of match of the year candidates on top of match of the year candidates that we expect from him but this was a more understated year 
year where he tried to have his own internal story where he wasn't using the Rainmaker and introduced his new submission called the Money Clip. And all of that came to a head in this matchup with Shingo Takagi where he constantly went for the Money Clip. Shingo Takagi hitting him with all his big moves. Doshigami uh, made in Japan. He even tried to go for Last of the Dragon, but Okada kept reversing and finally put him down with the Money Clip. Another 5.25 star matchup here. What was your thoughts on day 13 of the G1 Climax 30? First, man, I just have to say that the G1, if if people don't follow it, I mean, it's understandable if you don't because it's like a month long of getting up at 2, 3 a.m. to watch wrestling. I mean, it's like five o'clock six o'clock over in japan and you know people are still sleeping here but it's a grueling it's grueling but it's definitely worth it so this was definitely the probably this definitely was the best night of the whole tournament and then just like the names that you're listing right now kota abushi minoru suzuki shingo takagi kazusha okada like these are if these are like the top 10 or these are like guys that are at the top of um, New Japan Pro Wrestling right now. So just with that alone, you know that this is going to be a show of just great, great matches and just just a phenomenal showing from everybody on the card. And that's what I got out of it. Um, maybe it's a little bit too early to, to jump this or I'm jumping to like another segment. But Shingo Takagi, man, that in my opinion, it's been his year. It definitely has been his year. Um, he's been hitting on all cylinders, whether if he wins or loses. It it, it doesn't matter. You know you're going to get like a four plus star match out of him, and like it's just going to go up from there. You know, Okada again. I can definitely agree that it it wasn't his year, and it's because they don't have him in the, his proverbial top spot like they always do. And you guys mention it on <laughs> True Real Heat all the time. It's either. He's the champion, and he's doing everything, or they have nothing for him, and then he's just looking a little lost. And um, aside from like this match itself, that's pretty much what uh, Okada's been doing this year. So definitely, you know, again, if you're going to watch any night of the G1, which I recommend you to try to get at least half. You know, I won't, you know, put that pressure on you guys to see the whole thing. But if you're going to watch any night, definitely watch this. Minoru Suzuki versus Kota Ibushi and uh, Shingo Takagi versus Kazucho Okada. Those are definitely, watch the whole show, but those are definitely the two matches that you want to look out for and pay attention the most to. Yeah, this was a night that did not have a bad match uh, no. at all. Uh, you also had Will Ospreay versus Taishi, which had to be one of Taishi's greatest matches of his career as well. And you also had the the Bullet Club uh, turmoil come to a head as Yujiro Takahashi went one-on-one with Switchblade Jay White. This one had storylines, it had action, and it had two tremendous match of the year candidates. So worth going out of your way to watch. Watch. Coming in at number four, we have another one from AEW, AEW Full Gear, their final pay-per-view of 2020. This one was jam-packed from top to bottom. A lot of people going into this show said it would be uh, AEW's best pay-per-view ever, and it's definitely, I would say, in the top three of the pay-per-views that they have delivered over their first two years of existence. This show featured another 5.25 star rated from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, a match of the year candidate, and in the eyes of many, including Brian Alvarez, one of the greatest tag team matches in history as the Young Bucks defeated FTR to win the AEW World Tag Team titles. This was a beautiful love letter to to, uh, tag team wrestling with moves from the Steiners to the Hart Foundation to the Dudleys to the Hardy boys and the mantra of FTR of no flips just fits came to a head in the finish where Cash Wheeler used a 450 springboard 450 to miss and then uh, Matt Jackson hit a super kick with no with no shoe on so he used basically a fist to defeat <laughs> all fists and no flips so it was a great matchup worth going out of your way just for that match alone but it also had a very very 
very fantastic opener of Kenny Omega going one-on-one with Hangman Page in the finals of the world title eliminator. This was like a G1 style matchup. It was just all action, intense, and the two guys just went at it with fight and spirit all throughout with Kenny Omega getting the victory with the one wing angel. This also foreshadowed the alliance between Kenny Omega and Don Callis as the Impact EVP was on commentary for this match. Matchup. You also had Darby Allen defeating Cody Rhodes for the TNT Championship in a very story storytelling based matchup there, and then the physically intense, bloody and brutal main event of John Moxley defeating Eddie Kingston in an I Quit match using barbed wire around his arm to choke out his former friend. What did you think of Full Gear? Man, I. <sighs> This was definitely a phenomenal show from top to bottom. I definitely was on the round table for this. And I will say that uh, I was one of the people that didn't, not necessarily didn't get, but didn't really agree on the finish to the Young Bucks versus FPR match. But despite that, the overall match was amazing, man. Like the callbacks to tag team wrestling, that was great. These guys, as much as the business is going to evolve, they they did this paying homage to the teams that came before them, and that was really really uh, a great thing to see. Um, the main event, man, it was uh, brutal and 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 just phys- the physicality was on another level. But like going into the match, I was saying, how can you how can you want to see Eddie Kingston lose, man? He wants to make his mom happy. He wants to make his mother proud. I can't root against anybody like that. I, and, I, and I'm like, shit, I would not be upset if he won this. And he didn't. But it was still a great match to see. It was just like, oh, man. And he like the, the, the tears coming out. He had to like silently say, I quit. I gave up. He didn't want to. He didn't want to just. He just had to fight, fight, fight. You know, that barbed wire was getting a little bit too real. He said, oh, fuck this. I got to. Like, all right, we got to get this out of here. <laughs> but um, also, I definitely want to piggyback off of the opener with Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page because even then you know as as much as these guys were as much as they were going through it you know with uh Hangman losing himself and FTR getting in his head to the point where they lost the tag titles now you know Kenny doesn't want anything to do with them but he's still showing up every time Hangman has a match on to be on commentary you know that was the the little seeds being planted as to you know where Kenny is right now and then, um, you know, just the match itself and then pretty much the proverbial washing of his hands by just looking at him and then just walking out of the ring and moving on saying, this is this is behind me now. Now I'm going to just go forward and look where Kenny Omega is now. He's, he's I, well, I don't want to jump the gun if we're going to jump, you know, if we're going into anything later. But, you know, now as he's the AW world champion, you know, the, the pretty much the partnership between AW and Impact right now that's pretty much boosting both of Impact and AEW for people that don't know how partnerships work. So that's this show had everything and then just everything after the fact of this show is showing on, you know, the weekly promotions and, and pay-per-views and just popping up everywhere. So definitely and I think this was a step up from the previous pay-per-view, which was um I wanna say well, what was the, the All out all out. Yeah, this definitely was a step up, I believe, in my opinion. Where um, all out was good, but um, full gear was was awesome. So definitely a phenomenal show. Yes, totally agree with everything you said there. You also had a breakout performance for John Silva of yes. the Dark Order against Orange Cassidy. Uh, Hikaru Shida defeated Nyla Rose to sexy defend the AEW Women's World Championship. And the spectacle that was the elite deletion with Matt Hardy defeating Sammy Guevara. So this one had a little bit of everything for every professional wrestling fan. All right, I had to do a quick little change because we're getting in to the top three, sir. This is the top three matches. And ironically enough, this is all from the beginning part of the year. So this is no recency bias. And it shows you the impact of having fans in attendance for these wrestling shows coming in at number one. Three, we have WWE Raw Rumble 2020. This is from January. Of course, you had uh, the the very fun and I, I think 
overachieved uh, false count anywhere match between Roman Reigns and King Corbin uh, that went all around the baseball stadium over there. <laughs> you also had uh, the Women's Royal Rumble where Charlotte Flair uh, won out defeating Shayna Baszler in the final two. You also had Asuka versus Becky Lynch, arguably the, the best Fiend match ever with him versus Daniel Bryan in a strap match. But of course, it's all about the men's Royal Rumble match, which in my opinion is probably a top five Royal Rumble match ever. Just perfectly built, for, perfectly booked by the WWE with Brock Lesnar kind of being the highlight of the first half of the show. Uh, really dominating the first half of the Rumble, eliminating a whole bunch of people. His standoff with Keith Lee, Keith Lee making his uh, debut there. And then you had Drew McIntyre eliminating him in one of the biggest pops of the entire year. And of course, even a bigger pop than that was Edge's return uh, in this matchup after a nine-year absence. And of course, in the end, it was Drew McIntyre getting a victory. What was your thoughts on the Royal Rumble 2020, Ness? Yeah, the Royal Rumble was one of the better pay-per-views, especially being pre-pandemic, you know, the crowd there. Royal Rumble with no crowd, we don't know. I don't know how they're going to try to pull that off. I don't even want to think about that at this point because the crowd makes the Royal Rumble. So, But definitely with Charlotte Flair winning the Women's Royal Rumble, just more of an accolade for her that you just keep stacking up, stacking up, and then going on to face Rhea, Rhea Ripley, Instead of challenging for the uh, SmackDown Women's title or the Raw Women's title, you know, giving that spotlight to NXT was a great thing. And then far as the men's Royal Rumble, you know, that definitely was greatly booked with, you know, Brock just tossing everybody out as soon as they come in up until, you know, he runs into Keith Lee and he just can't move Keith Lee the way he was moving everybody else. And then with, you know, Drew McIntyre going on to win the whole thing and just the start of his run for the beginning of the year, just for the year he's had. So that was definitely a great pay-per-view on WWE's part and it highlighted so many people and then just to go on for them to have the year that they had. Yeah. It was just a lot of different stuff kind of like were foreshadowed at this uh, Raw Rumble. You know, the Like you said, the whole Rhea Ripley and Charlotte Flair match, which had, uh, for better or worse, a great impact on uh, the rest of the year. But more importantly, definitely the uh, the foreshadowing that Drew McIntyre was going to have a huge year, two-time WWE champion. But it all started here with winning the Raw Rumble in Minute Maid Park in Houston, Texas. But I... I, I would I would argue that Edge's return is probably the moment of the year. How about you? Yeah, man, definitely the return, the pretty much the only return of the year that was worth talking about. We're not going to even going to mention fucking Goldberg, you know that whole travesty. But you know, did nobody ever see this coming? I definitely didn't, especially with the way that um, WWE's been handling uh, talent, you know, with neck injuries and just severe injuries in general. To have someone like Edge and everybody knows his, you know, his condition with his, his neck, you know, the, for him to come back, that was definitely one of the greatest moments of the year. You know, I, I, from then on with, you know, him versus Randy Orton, that whole thing that... That was the peak of it, his return. And then, you know, just kind of went down after that. But, you know, just the return itself, that was a great feel-good moment. We always need these type of moments just in wrestling in general, and especially for an event like the Royal Rumble where, you know, there's always an set amount of people to be there. But we need some surprises, you know, either returns, debuts, any anything of that nature to make the event just that more that, that much more special and edge's return definitely filled that void and definitely made it that much better absolutely agree with you there so we're gonna move on to number two and coming in at number two we go back to january but this time to the beginning of january january 4th with new japan pro wrestling wrestle kingdom 14 night one we could have put both wrestle kingdoms together but you know uh two two four hour shows is a lot to get through but if you had to watch one of these shows january 4th was that show uh so many great matches you had you had the big crowd in tokyo uh for wrestle 
Universal Kingdom. The Tokyo Dome had over 40,000 in attendance for this show. But the headline was, of course, the main event of Kota Obushi going one-on-one with Kazuka Okada. One of the best matches of the entire year. These guys just told a beautiful story across almost 40 minutes of competitive competition uh the diehard attitude of koto obushi meeting the artistry of kazuka okada you had uh koto obushi trying to realize his destiny of becoming the heavyweight champion and then moving on to get a shot at the intercontinental title the following night and these two men just went at it for a, a tremendous bout uh one of the better matches of the year and rated 5.75 Five stars by Dave Meltzer on the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Before that, you had uh, Hiromu Takahashi going one-on-one with Will Ospreay in a five-and-a-half star rated match from the Wrestling Observer. This one was just incredible. Just some of the craziest sequences you will ever see in a professional wrestling match. Just insane reversals. I think the highlight is the the, the moment where Ospreay does a sake special and Hiromu Romu catches him on the outside in a German suplex. He flips, he puts the German suplex on uh, Osprey, but Osprey lands on his feet. He then runs out of Romu. Romu gives him a belly to belly, but Osprey goes through the ropes back into the ring to do the sake special. Just an amazing, out of this world type of sequence. But you also had a whole bunch of other great matches on this card besides those two classics. You had Tensuya Naito defeating Jay White, the Switchblade. You had John Moxley uh, re- regaining the IWGP U.S. Heavyweight Championship over Lance Archer in a Texas death match. You had Finn Juice over Gorillas of Destiny to win the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team titles. And you had the first of Jushin Thunder Liger's final two matches here in the Tokyo Dome. What was your thoughts on Wrestle Kingdom 14 Night 1? Man, this was just an overall amazing show. One of the best parts about it was I drove all the way up to New York, me and drunk guy JJ, to watch it with some of the True Hill good brothers. And that just made this night just that much better, man. Like the action pack matches, just the overall feel. I always say that New Japan with Wrestle Kingdom sets the year off right and everybody else has to follow them. And they either live up or try to live up to that standard or they just don't and this is just a hard act to follow for the rest of the year and as we as we can see being the second major best show of the year on our countdown just goes to show how much true like how true that is you know Kazuchika Okada versus Kota Ibushi in the main event you're not going to find two better two better guys to match up for a match. You know, there's there's a lot that can you know compare to it, but they just put on a phenomenal performance. And then you know, my personal favorite, Tetsuya Naito, going on you know just be defeating Jay White and going on to you know submit his destino at Wrestle Kingdom. Also, you know, just oh man. Uh, Ta- Hiromu Takahashi versus Will Ospreay. Just that sequence. That that was just one of the great moments during that match. The sequence that you were just describing. Which, if you haven't seen it, go out of your way to see it. I know a lot of people say that, oh, we don't like the gymnastics and the flippy stuff. But when there's psychology to it, which this match definitely had the psychology. They weren't just out there doing the spots and flipping and things of that nature just to be doing it. Everything was set up perfectly for these moments to happen. So that was definitely another one of the matches of the night. And then you have, you know, for the for the Western fans, the more American fans, you have John Moxley versus Lance Archer in a Texas Tornado Death match, was pr- pretty much just a hardcore match. So that there was there's a variety for everyone on the the Wrestle Kingdom card, and it was just like feel good moments for everyone all around. And like I, like I said before, man, New Japan just knows how to get the ball rolling at the top of the year, and they just keep the steam going for the rest of the year. 
Yeah, and it's like a lot of long-term storytelling was uh, drawn out over the week, over the two nights. But especially with this show, with Hiromu coming back from the 18 months being injured uh, with a broken neck, and, uh, getting a shot at the title that he never really lost against his like career rival in Will Ospreay, who th- these have kind of been the pillars of junior heavyweight wrestling. And this was like uh, Will Ospreay's final junior heavyweight matchup, really, when you look at it in retrospect that's how more significant that match will be and with Kodo Obushi and uh, Kajuko Okada you had Okada's history with not only you know Kodo Obushi's future tag team partner that would be in the golden aces with Tadahashi who is one of uh, Okada's like gods well his other god is Nakamura who is in a stable with Kajuko Okada and then his best friend his golden lover is Kenny Omega and we know the history between Okada and 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 uh omega so so many different elements and so many different layers especially in those two matches an- alone then you also brought up tensuya naito with jay white jay white had defeated him twice or well, once in the g1 and then once for the intercontinental title and this was following t- tensuya naito's probably worst year ever in 2019 where yeah. he just kept kept coming close to glory and then kept failing and failing and failing and failing and this was the start of a really transformative year for him in 2020. Yeah, damn you, Gato. Damn you, Gato. It, it worked out again, though. So, but damn you for that. So, any honorable mentions? We know we we mentioned some honorable mentions at the beginning of this video, but any honorable mentions you want to mention before we get to our number one? Uh, no, I think we covered everything. You know, like there were a lot of great shows. I'm really not going to sit here and try to you know try to pick out of them because over the, the course of the just even just one promotion you know the, throughout the whole year like it was just great you know especially with the pandemic and everything like i'm just glad that wrestling was thriving and we, we got to go out there and people got to go out there and perform and put on these great shows even with the state of the world that you know that we're currently in and they just went out there and and, and made us feel good to just just to get away from everything that's going on, you know, just even was, even if it was for a few hours, you know, like that was something that I appreciated as a fan. I'm sure you do as well. And, and everybody else that we, you know, we talk wrestling with that we can just get away from the, the, the craziness of the world for a little bit and enjoy what we love. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Like, uh, I I would have to mention uh, WrestleMania 36. I think I mentioned it at the beginning of the video, but I got to mention it again because that was kind of the first one that happened after the whole pandemic. And that was kind of just took you out of, you know, thinking about what was going on in the world. So that was kind of like a perfectly timed event. And having it across two days was an improvement uh, over like one seven hour show. I'd rather two, three and a half hours shows so that's one thing that i think wwe definitely needs to follow up on and continue doing in the in the new year i think we also mentioned when we talked about takeover 31 but nxt takeover portland was like 10a or 10b <laughs> i think it just it just missed out on our countdown mainly because people pro- we probably didn't remember it as well but that's one of the greatest takeovers that i've ever seen with dominic Dom- dijakovic for Versus Keith Lee, you had Broser Waits versus the Undisputed Era, Finn Balor versus Johnny Gargano. So many great matches on that card. So that was definitely one that just missed out on our top 10 here. But that brings us to number one, the number one show of 2020. And we go back to February of this year with AEW Revolution from Chicago, Illinois. This one was one of the best built shows from top to bottom. Just so many. There was three main really killer matches. You had Jon Moxley defeating Chris Jericho to become the AEW World Champion. Just a tremendous pop when he became the champion and the culmination of his chase from coming into AEW to that moment defeating Chris Jericho and what a great build those guys put together with the inner circle. Uh, you also had Orange Cassidy star making performance against Pac and that's one match that you couldn't even imagine not having fans for that 
one that that we, we wouldn't have had it got the same impact if that didn't have any fans so that was a great one to remember as one of the last shows that had a full crowd uh in front of it and of course there was the six star wrestling observer classic of kenny omega and hangman page versus the young bucks the highest rated tag team matchup in wrestling observer newsletter er- uh, ever and in my opinion the best tag team match i've ever seen just a mixture of great storytelling a tremendous build-up uh out of this world outstanding in ring action and a culmination of kind of like six years of storytelling between the elite and it coming together in this moment to just deliver a you know a star making performance for hangman page another classic for kenny omega and once again proving why the young bucks are arguably the greatest tag team of this generation just so many great stuff but most especially a hot crowd that reacted to everything including one of the biggest pops biggest reactions from people sitting in chicago illinois and sitting at home when kenny omega kicked out of the golden trigger from from the young bucks at one like they had the audacity to use him and his lover's finishing move and that man just powered up and used the power of koto Ibushi to kick out at one just a great moment right there but what stood out to you the most from aew revolution and of course the aforementioned tag team match oh man the well first i gotta start with the tag team match uh no better match of the year that definitely was literally the match of the year and it's not often if ever a tag team match wins or has that much praise to be considered the match of the year you have in my personal uh, opinion, my favorite tag team of all time, literally, the Young Bucks. And then you have mixed that with, you know, two of their best friends, Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. And it's just like the chemistry that these guys already got chemistry because they're around each other all the time. Now they're facing off in a match where there's a hot crowd. There's definitely going to be top notch in ring uh action suspense drama everything that everything that you would want in a wrestling match it had and like i said before we don't really get that much tag team wrestling of that caliber we get a lot of good and great tag team matches and amazing but we don't get them on the level that this match had so that was definitely the like i said the match of the year um also the chase that John Moxley went through to get to becoming the AEW world champion. Just that was a great moment in itself. You know, him coming in again, having to deal with Kenny when he first came in be- defeating probably at the moment, Kenny was like the hottest or one of the hottest um, professional wrestlers in the, in, in the world at that time. So him just coming over and showing that he can hang, with the best of them, that was just a feather in his cap. And then going on to beating Chris Jericho and becoming AEW world champion, that was definitely a feel-good moment. And then just the overall show, like, again, the crowd being there pre-pandemic, they definitely added to the the, the excitement and the, and the hype of the show, you know. Um, hopefully, eventually, it's soon, like, they're starting, they're, you know, they're adding people back, a little bit of the crowd, so that's great, but... You know, you know, back then, before the pre-pandemic, man, the crowd was just so important there, and they definitely just added to the show. Also, like I said, um, Orange Cassidy, that really, that performance versus Pac. Pac is definitely one of my favorite performers, so I don't question his um, his in-ring ability, him as a character at all. I didn't really have much uh, notoriety with Orange Cassidy prior to that. Uh, but he can definitely from like now he's one of my favorite people in AEW. <laughs> you know he can definitely go in the ring when he feels like it. You know he's the star. yeah that's the Sometimes character. He doesn't feel like it unless you know you gotta you gotta bring that fight out of him. So and then Pac definitely I I want to say he probably was the first or one of the first people to bring that fight out of Orange Cassidy. So now once we see him. We know that where you know where that comes from. So overall, they definitely deserve to have the number one spot on this countdown. And just shout out to AEW. You know, just what was like a year, two years of television under under their belts now. So 
they're just trying to they're not even trying they're just going out there and showing like they know what to do with so little time on television and pay-per-view they know how to go out there and put on a show and give the fans what they want so kudos to them and for a phenomenal year Absolutely. This one kind of stands out and stands above uh, so many different shows, but definitely one of the best shows that AEW has ever put together. You also had Darby Allen defeating Sammy Guevara in an all action sprint with a great table spot there for Sammy, from Sammy Guevara. Uh, you, you had uh, just great performances from top to bottom throughout the show. MJF defeating Cody Rhodes and the culmination of their bitter rivalry as well so this one is one that will be remembered for a very long time key performances for the young stars as well as an all-time classic just everything you would want out of the perfect match was that tag team match between the young bucks and kenny omega and hangman page so well deserving of aew revolution as our best major show of 2020 so that is all for our top 10 best major shows of 2020 put down in the comment section below what you guys thought about the countdown if we missed any shows that you think should have been included in the top 10 did we get our number one right or do you disagree let us know in the comment section below like this video share this video with all your wrestling fans and friends you can share it with us and tag us on social media it's at true hill heat on facebook twitter and instagram of course there is the i card down at the bottom you can push that to subscribe and the bell below that to press all for all notifications for all the great content right here on true hill heat ness tell the fine people where they can find you on social media you guys can find me on twitter at skinny underscore kravitz you can find me on instagram at skinny underscore underscore kravitz and you can find me right here on the true hill heat youtube channel i am the sixth man of the true hill heat youtube channel team i pop up on usually pop up on all the round tables it's just been a hectic holiday so work's been kicking my ass but Getting back into things. I am the Roundtable Rebel, so I'm always on the Roundtables. You can catch me on Review of Honor with my man, the Stat King, the man of 1,004 numbers. You can also catch me on Blunt Impact and Joints and Jabronis with my man, Chris G. We form the Pot Heels. We smoke a little smoke, and we talk wrestling. So if you like either of those, come join us. <laughs> Come join us and definitely check those out for sure. You can follow me on Instagram at TrueHeel underscore Epic SP3. Find me every single Wednesday on the Wrestle2 YouTube channel with Alex McCarthy on Wrestling Daily at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, live 8 p.m. Uh, BST, and of course every single Saturday on the True Hill Heat podcast. Check out True Hill Heat 105 with our year end awards as voted on by you guys guys on the facebook uh group page as well as the true heel heat youtube channel cast and we got plenty more year end countdowns for you to enjoy so check those out as well so for the three time three time three time baby making champion ness it is me it is me your true hill phenom sp3 like this video comment share and subscribe this has been our top 10 best major shows of 2020 we are signing off until next time